Welcome to our Emergence 2020 workshop series. I'm Catherine Lee. I'm on the board of the Red Chamber Cultural Society, the host of this event. The topic is The Stage is My Home, The Art of Performing. We have guest mentor Dee Daniels joining us today. Uh, Dee is a unique talent who transcends musical orders when she brings her jazz styling infused with gospel and blues flavoring to the stage. She performs and records globally with symphony orchestras, big bands, and the world's leading jazz artists. An internationally respected vocal clinician, adjudicator, and mentor, Dee presents clinics, workshops, and master classes globally. In 2019, she joined <clears throat> Excuse me. She joined the faculty of the Conservatory of Music at the University of the Pacific in California. She created the D. Daniels Jazz Vocal Scholarship, awarded at the D. Miero Jazz Festival in Edmonds, Washington in 2017, was on the faculty of the vocal department at the Aaron Copeland School of Music at Queens College in New York from 2013 to 2014. And uh, next we have Dr. Deirdre Morgan. Deirdre is a virtuoso and scholar. She's been a powerful force in the revival of Jews Hark internationally. Although this instrument is treated as a novelty in the West, the Jews Harp has a centuries old tradition as a voice of what's traditionally unheard from the emotional to the spirit world. Dr. Morgan is an important figure in the research, preservation, and contemporization of the Jews' harp within the international music and scholarly community. She holds a PhD in ethnomusicology and is currently a sessional lecturer in music at Simon Fraser University and Vancouver Community College. She also works in gender studies inside and outside of the music community. An award-winning vocalist, Crystal Dos Santos is known for her powerful voice and her infectious warmth. Crossing genres, she combines soul with jazz, pop, funk, and blues into her own unique expression, while seamlessly moving between each style with total command. In addition to her music career, her developed sense of performance and stagecraft have launched her into a successful modeling and TV acting career. Whether as a solo artist, fronting a band, or being in front of the camera, Dos Santos exudes confidence, poise, and power. A dynamic performer, Crystal is always a step ahead of the crowd. Okay, well, first of all, I'd like to say uh, it's so nice to have you all here. Uh, all of you on the screen and those who are uh, listening to the or watching the streaming um, version. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in my teaching, and this is uh, no matter where I've been in the world, is uh, one of the problems that, that um, uh, I get from students that they'd like to figure out what to do, how to do, is to get out of that state of being nervous uh, and uncomfortable on stage. And um, uh, one of the things that I learned very early in my career, I had an opportunity to uh, take some lessons from what I consider to be a master uh, vocal instructor who um, actually became my mentor. And his name was George Peckham. I met George way back um, in, when I was starting out in Seattle, Washington. And uh, one of the things that George told me is uh, the music is in your mind, not in your body, okay? So, um, and he's the person also that encouraged me to, um, to start teaching. Um, I, uh, it took me a little while to, to uh, figure out what that really meant. I mean, intellectually, I said, okay, yeah, that makes sense. But what does that mean in a practical operational sense when I'm performing on stage? And um, I, I, I think I figured it out uh, and I expanded upon what he said and to say that what you think and continue to think because thoughts 
become things and there's power in words, you will manifest. So if you're saying that you're afraid, you're nervous, you're uncomfortable, you don't know how to do this, you can't hit that high C or whatever, that's what's going to be. And um, you might have a hit and miss situation where you get it every now and then, you feel like you're in your groove and so forth, but it's going to be a hit and miss situation. So what you think and continue to think is something that you're going to manifest. So uh, if you reverse that, what you, um, uh, uh, if you want to, if you want to be comfortable, that's what you have to start thinking and saying and uh, it, uh, imagining in your mind, you know. So, um, uh, and another way I, I found to say this um, <clears throat> is when I go onto the stage, I am actually, actually before I get onto the stage, because mentally, I'm already there and I know exactly what I want to do. I'm open, I'm receptive because I, my goal is to remain in the moment because that's where my power is, that's where my creativity is, that's where my music is, that's where everything is. Nothing exists to me outside of the moment. So I'm, I'm already there. But when I get on the stage, I am actually in my mind, in my room. I'm in my home. I'm in my living room and all the people in the room, and I don't care whether there's only 10 people or 10,000 people, they are invited guests that I have invited into my home. And I am a gracious hostess. So I want to make sure that everybody is comfortable having a good time. There's food to eat, there's plenty to drink, you know, introducing everybody. And that, that's where I am. So everybody there, and that, that's 360 degrees, not just the 180, the people in front of me, but it's the people in the wings, the monitor guy, the, the lights guy, the, the staff, the organization, my band, everybody is in my space. And I love people. And all I want to do is to make them comfortable, make them happy and all of this kind of thing, you know? So when I got to that point, all of that stuff about nervousness, which I do not allow people to say to me, singers that is, because that's nervousness is a, a, it's a state of mind. Uh, what you're maybe feeling physically is actually too much adrenaline. You know, adrenaline will make your stomach queasy and make you all kinds of things, you know. So, but you can control adrenaline simply by breathing. But if you add to the breath, the fact of what you want to do, and that is to be relaxed and bring yourself all of your energy to focus it right here in the moment, that's what's going to happen. You know, so, um, uh, and once people get that concept, which I think in my experience, most people can get that right away and go out and try it. You got to have courage <laughs> to take that step and go out there and actually try it, right? But just the thought of it, from what I, I get from my students, uh, and, and visualizing that, said, oh yeah, okay, this is my space. Okay, yeah, I like people. I want people to, to enjoy themselves, you know? And instantaneously, they're able to uh, uh, go out there and be in that moment and be comfortable. Uh, I don't have my stage life and then my off stage life. I just have life. So I take it wh wherever, I, wherever I am, I'm me. And this approach for me allows me to be me anywhere, anytime. I don't have to change up. I don't have to change my way of thinking. I don't have to change my way of being, you know, I am what I am and what you see is what you get, you know, anytime, just like right now, I'm, I'm in my home, you know, I feel comfortable, but I, my home is with me wherever I am, you know, so it takes all the pressure off. It takes all the pressure of, of uh, how I'm going to deal with people because I'm, I'm dealing the same way with my band. You know, I want them to be comfortable. You know, we're a team. It's not the singer and the band, you know, or the leader, and then the rest of the people in, in the band, we are a team, we're a unit, and we have made an agreement to come and be in the same place at the same time, doing the same songs and the same, and, and, and a style with a tempo and all of that kind of stuff, you know? So it's always a team effort. And if we're uh, two or three assemble themselves touching and agreeing, you know, 
that becomes a real powerful possibility. There's so much amazingness in what Dee just shared with us all. And there's so much to sort of play off of and respond to with that. Thank you, Dee, for getting us off on such an amazing foot. Um, some of the notes that I had prepared obviously connect to this, and I'm sure we're gonna see that with what Crystal is gonna say as well, because there are kind of universal experiences of like the mind body sort of split thing, dichotomy thing that happens when you get on stage and start feeling uncomfortable or start feeling nervous. So I do wanna sort of elaborate on that same topic and, and speak to that. So I lived, when I was doing my PhD, I lived in London and I lived in an international residence with a lot of different people from around the world. And there were actually a lot of musicians there. And there was this one guy who was a concert pianist and he was playing like the craziest venues in London, you know, like Royal Albert Hall and like the, the, the most intimidating venues, some of the most intimidating venues in the world, basically, these massive like historical halls. And he was a soul, usually playing solo, right? Um, and I had a chat with him once and I was like, how do you handle that, you know? Um, how do you handle the pressure of being in spaces like that? Because the space, um, you know, what Dee's saying about the space doesn't actually matter. That's absolutely true, but it can really feel like it does. <laughs> and there are some spaces, you know, there's, there's a difference psychologically between the open mic space with five of your friends in the audience and like the big festival, right? Um, and so one of the tricks is sort of getting over that and saying, well, no matter the size, what you said, it's my living room. I love that. But I asked him about these venues because I was really curious about it. And he, and I said, do you, do you get nervous? Like, how do you deal with the stage fright? And he said, it never goes away. It's always gonna be there. You're always gonna feel the rush of nerves. You're gonna feel all those little physiological bodily sensations. And he said the main breakthrough for him was not seeing it as anxiety, but seeing it as energy. So when you feel those inevitable bodily sensations, the narrative that you build around them and the story that you start telling yourself about what they mean and what they're going to do to you. So you got to transform it from, oh my God, I'm nervous. This is going to derail me. I'm going to make a mistake. I'm going to be judged maybe I'm not that good. Uh-oh, like that spirals really quickly. We all know that, right? That spirals into imposter syndrome. It spirals into second guessing yourself, which just makes you feel more terrible. So when you feel the bodily tingles, the heart rate going up, maybe your digestive system starts moving. Um, maybe you really have to pee. That's something that happens to me. Like there's, we all have our tells, right? We all have like the, the physical things um, the way that our bodies react when we kind of go into the fight or flight uh, nervous system response to what we see as this threat. Oh my God, I'm going to be seen. I'm really going to be seen, right? Um, so instead of all that going, hey, oh, I'm feeling the adrenaline. I'm starting to feel the signs of the physiological reality of performance, which is not really a normal thing to do. Performance is, is a heightened reality. It's not really like our everyday life. We're doing something different in the act of performance that is very different from even just practicing, even just practicing at home or in a practice room or, in, or even recording in a studio. Those are all really different types of spaces. So performing on stage, you need to be able to go, ooh, I feel the tingles. Here comes the energy that's going to allow me to transcend myself and go into the heightened state. So see it as, ooh, here comes the power. And then tell yourself, this is the power that allows me to channel into that performance. And it, it allows me to do the thing. It allows me to be bigger than I am in my daily life. And maybe even more focused and more in the zone. So that was a huge, that's been a huge thing for me. Um, and I don't think the goal should ever be to not be nervous. The goal should be to change the story that we tell when we feel the thing that we then immediately label as nervous. So instead of going like, uh oh, I, I think I'm panicking. I'm going to panic more about the fact that I'm panicking. Those of you who are a little bit 
anxious like me might, might know what I'm talking about. Um, to go, oh, hey, yeah, here it comes. Like, here comes my power. This is, this is a good thing. This is a positive thing. Um, and there's so much more to say, but maybe that's good for just a, an initial thought. May, may I interject something, Catherine? Sure. Um, uh, first of all, as I said, mentioned earlier, uh, I don't allow my students to use the word nervous because nervousness is, has negative connotations and it's fear-based. But you got, we're, none of us are really afraid to do what we want to do. We love doing what we want to do, and that's why we do it. So, but what's really happening, as Deidre alluded to, is that we're actually going through a natural process of a, an adrenaline rush. That, that's really what it is. Like, okay. Uh, and you can, you can bring in all of these other things that are, that, that are about fear and, you know, and all of the things that Deidre mentioned, you know, or you don't have to, you have a choice in the very beginning to go there in fear or to say, no, this is something I really love and that I'm, I'm here in my space, in my comfort zone, they're invited and I have something I want to share with people in this at, at this time in this space in this place that we've all uh, uh, gathered here so um I, to me you know i'm all, i'm always emphasizing choice you have choice you always have choice you know and uh but you, we have to redefine you know what's really going on and get get away with the whole nervousness thing and say what it is it's adrenaline if you have a runner running a race the drill is get on your mark get set go well the get set part is the where the adrenaline comes in because if you didn't have it you just fall flat so we need to have that that adrenaline in order to to lift off you know as, as Deidre said to lift off and go ahead and give what we want to give to share like it it's it's the story as Deirdre was describing the story that we're telling ourselves and changing that story so that we're not attaching a negative connotation to that that sense of rush or you know uh adrenaline that you described it's a good thing we need yeah. that <laughs> yeah yeah we, yeah. That. we, we learn how to control it yeah. and there are ways to control it you know first is here what yeah. do you want not what don't you want but what do you want if you live in the end of what it is that we're doing, if you go to the end and what you really do want, it helps you get there from the moment you begin through to the end. You know, but if we don't make decisions, well, we're just left to whatever is out there, viruses, bacteria, fungus, you know, somebody else's thing and all <laughs> kinds of stuff is out there. You know, but when you make the decision, then you give all of your energy a focus uh, to uh, uh, help you accomplish what it is you want to do. I'm just jazzed about the whole darn subject. I love this so much. Um, I thank you, thank you, Dee. Thank you, Deirdre. Like everything that you've said has already resonated with me so much. So I don't want to be too, too redundant on already what's been said, but I also just want to say hi to all the familiar faces, the people who were here last time, who were here last year, who I've seen and know before. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, so I think in terms of like uh, channeling and redirecting that energy, that adrenaline, that that beautiful power as, as has so eloquently eloquently been said I think um sometimes I'm, I'm as I'm doing it I'm making notes um as to what these ladies are saying so I can add to as opposed to just repeat um I think there's a really cool way where you can take that mental thing and you can have your goal and you can know what you want but physically on stage before you while you're waiting in the wings or backstage do some jumping jacks you know, shake your arms out, bend over, get physical and get into your body so that you are actually, you know, or maybe have a routine. I know singers who in musical theater did a full hour yoga routine before they ever hit the stage because it helps you to get into your body and it helps to align your mind and your breath. And those things are so incredibly connected your body and your performance um is a very very connected thing so it's like it's like an athlete warming up 
as we've talked about athletes before, you know, you have to warm up you know, the whole physical sense, the whole mental sense. So I find yoga is a really good one because it's, it is very mind and body. Um, another thing that I thought about is when you're going on stage, if you're feeling nervous in a foreign place, let's say you're on tour, bring a little something on stage with you to help you feel at home. Like Dee was saying, you know, home is wherever she goes and maybe like a little rug under your microphone where your feet can land and you can feel that familiar tactile sense um, can really help you sort of anchor into your space and make it your home. So again, I'm just trying to build on what's already been said. Um, and another thing is if you have the choice and you have a set that you're able to build, I know sometimes in musical theater or other performance things, it's set for you. However, if you can make your own set list, then start with familiar material because it takes me one or two songs to just really warm up wherever I am. And, you know, if you do the songs that you're like, this is my, this is my home base song. This is my, this is my way of um, aligning just like what your prep work is before you can still be preparing on stage as you go. And I think if you choose really familiar material for the first two to three songs, then it'll really help you align to opening up and getting to know your audience because it's always different. Sometimes audiences are so appreciative, but pin drop quiet. And then sometimes audiences are really out there and vocal and with you. And it depends on what you like, but always know that they're there for you and they're there to receive you. It's just, you know, a matter of how they're going to respond. So you have to sort of in tune, change your caliber to match what they're doing so that you can give them that same resonance, you know, no matter how they're responding to you. Um, another thing, I was at the Canadian Music Week, God, this was like six years ago or something. Um, and a gentleman named Tom Jackson did a live performance coaching with Divine Brown on stage. And that was a really cool thing to watch. Um, his name's Tom Jackson and his website is onstagesuccess.com. So he does these like programs and you, I think you can either buy them or watch them or I don't know how you get them. I've never done it, I should. I'm interested in it, but <laughs> so I'm being, but I've seen him live. So this is where my uh, opinion of him is coming from. He will, break it down to nearly a science of being on stage, the, like a live performance where he will take you to the points of the stage and say, hit left, hit center, hit right, you know, open yourself up to this sort of like visual and very kind of like, how do I say it? Like a mapped out plan and then sometimes when you don't know what you're doing you know you get nervous and oh my god right but like Dee said she knows what she wants to do when she's on that stage if you have a plan and I like to loosely plan because I always know that I go off the handle <laughs> and I'm like you know what happens if I go do this you know but if I have an idea a real bone bare bones structure of what I want to do and what I want to accomplish on stage then at least I know you know I'm gonna go over there for this song or I'm gonna sit on the stool for this song, you know, then at least you can kind of have a couple of points of familiarity where you're like, oh my God, I'm flailing. Well, you can come back and you can anchor, right? Um, so those are some of the general things that I think that um, uh, help me out. Also, again, I gotta reiterate, being friends with your band and having good positive energy backstage, um, you know, making sure that it's your family that you're working with, not literally, but, you know, make that positive energy happen. And it comes from you. It starts with you. You're the band leader. You're the person who wants to do that. If you're in theater or other things, you know, um, just be aware of your energy and your kindness. And again, nervousness as a negative thing rubs off. So if you're in it and you're positive and you're ready to go on stage and get your show and your performance going, it's going to rub off on people in a positive way. If you're nervous and I'm terrible and I can't do it, then it's going to rub off in a negative way. So know that your energy is 
incredibly infectious when you're hitting the stage and when you're setting the tone for your entire family and your band and the audience to receive you. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> uh, can, I, can I add something to that? Okay, that, that's fantastic. I love what you guys are saying. Um, something that, I, that happened to me back in 1992, um, it was the first time I was at the Lionel Hampton Jazz Festival. And um, there, it's a, it was a four-night festival. And I didn't know this until a week before uh, when I got the, the program in the mail that uh, there were going to be about 80 different uh, world-class jazz musicians, the, the, the living legends, the young lions, and everybody in between. And over the four nights, uh, there were going to be seven singers. Now, some of the people, some of the musicians that came, they only, they came from wherever, and they only played one song that they, they were put into a special group, not their usual band. And the, the music was so creative, it's incredible. So on my night, which was, uh, this went Wednesday through Saturday, on my night was Thursday. The other singer was Al Jarreau. Now you guys, are, you guys look really young there, so you probably don't know who the, he is, but Google Al Jarreau, okay? Um, and Al Jarreau was one of my heroes, right? And I said, Oh my God, you know, oh my God. So, um, and then they had all of these musicians. I mean, the Hank Jones trio, you know, the, the uh, um, oh my God, uh, Tommy Flanagan trio, the, the, all, all of these just musicians all over the yin yang, right? So um, uh, when, when my time was to come, they, for some reason, they put me and Al at the very end of the concert back to back, of course. I being the lesser person, I went first. That was good. I was glad to get it and get it out. I get out of there. But anyway, there were so many musicians per night that the concerts were at least three hours, but it was very well organized. It was at the University of Idaho in the Kibbe Dome, which is their athletic dome. So it, it's a, you know, there's thousands of people out there. The stage is huge and behind the stage, uh, there was another just big, big area that they had like three RVs there for the whoever was performing that night where they can kind of lounge out. They had a bistro back there. They had the big screen. They had a whole nother speaker system back there. It was like a party behind the stage, right? So here I am, little old me. And so, oh my God, how did I get here? You know, so, uh, uh, and this was, be, this is where I discovered the difference between nervous and adrenaline. Okay. So here I am. Um, uh, I've listened to all this great music. I met the critic Leonard Feather there who uh, had reviewed one of my CDs at that time. We became friends there. And I used to refer to him as my out front date because he would always come and get me, grab me by the hand and we'd go out into the audience and listen to whoever, you know, so excuse me. So anyway, um, just before my time was to come, I had so much adrenaline. It was like a fountain just spurting out of the top of my head, you know, and I'm shaking. I'm, I can't even hardly talk, you know, and it's just my stomach is rolling, you know, and all of that kind of stuff. My breathing is shallow, you know, so I stopped myself and started talking to myself. And I said, D, what do you want to do? And I'm just standing. I mean, there's people going all around me, you know, I'm just standing there off the stage because uh, the stage was elevated. And I said, okay, uh, wh what do you want to do here? I said, you, you know a lot of these people, but there's a whole lot more, thousands more that you don't know. So what do you want? Um, so I said, I want to, uh, uh, to make a difference in people's lives. So um, uh, I want to, I want to uh, uh, reach out to people. You know, and uh, as, I, as I'm saying this, I'm, uh, the word catalyst came to mind. Be, I said, I, I don't know who they are, but I have a source, okay? And you can call that source anything, God, your higher self, the universe, or nothing. It doesn't matter. I have a source that knows exactly what everybody in this building, in, in this place, needs right now. So what I want is to be used by that source to touch people in ways that only the source knows they need to be touched. 
And at that moment, the word catalyst came to mind. I said, that's it. I want to be a catalyst for the source to touch everybody here in ways that only the source knows they need to be touched. And at that moment, in my mind, because I'm a very visual person, I, I have my eyes closed and in my, my void there, there, there appeared this pipe. It was a, like a plumber's pipe, like a bronze pipe with the elbow, you know, boop. And my perspective was from behind. And there was this soft light source off to the right, uh, upper right, that was shining on the pipe. And as this, this happened in seconds, right? But as the pipe uh, appeared, liquid light that was dense came from off the top of my screen into the mouth of the pipe. And when it came out the elbow, it was like a ray of light, right? And at that moment, I felt like totally light, you know, and all of that adrenaline stuff, it was all gone. I felt like I lifted maybe six feet off the, off the ground as the guy, I'm hearing the guy starting my introduction, and I felt like I just, just drifted, you know, sideways on up the stairs to the stage, and all of a sudden I was there, and I think I was having an out-of-body experience, I'm not sure. But anyway, I, I don't remember very much of the performance, but I do remember that when I finished my last song, and I only did three, I was lucky to do three because most people only did one or two, uh, I had the sensation of like, and all of a sudden I was very conscious of where I was, I was back, you know, and then the shaking began, all right? And all I want to do is go that away to get off the stage, but I had to go by Lionel Hampton, who was there, this was the Lionel Hampton Festival, get the flowers, and then get off the stage. But, but before, when I got over to the corner, which was way over there, because this was a huge stage, Al Jarreau's at the top of the stairs and said, go back, go back, D, go back. And I look back and Lionel said, come back, come back. And I get out there and I realize that people are standing and they're clapping. I was oblivious to that, totally, you know. And, and uh, so I, I got the flowers and I went off. And at the end of the evening, I went back to my hotel room. And I sat there on the bed and I said, what the heck just happened, you know? And what this little voice here that I, 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 I still, I'm still learning to listen to more frequently says what you asked for, but way more than you could possibly have imagined in that moment. And since that moment, I never, ever go on stage without going there. And it just takes a moment because it's just a thought. What do you want? That's all I want. I got love. I'm here to share love. I don't care what the story setting is, what the musical thing is. The lyric, I don't care about that. It's all about love. And that helps me to be in my living room. You know, that helps me to go there and just be me. I unzip, uh, zippers from the top of my head all the way down to the tips of my toes. I reach in, open up, and it's nothing but love light. That's all it is. So that nervousness, nah. Adrenaline, yes. Do I know how to control it? Yep. Breathe it away. What do I want with it? I want to be here because I want to have adrenaline, but I don't want it to be in control of me, right? I want to use that energy that Crystal and Deidre are talking about to fo and focus it and then give it back. That's what I want, you know? And that goes for, once again, my thoughts are always 360 degrees. Because like Crystal said, you set up, you're the leader. You set up the, 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 the uh, environment, physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. You have that power. It's a very powerful thing and you can make a difference in people's lives and that's what it's all about. I mean, we're here to share. Make a difference. You know, don't we want to take people on journeys? You know, tell the stories and make them cry, make them laugh, you know, and, and being real. Then you can be yourself. You can be really real. And if you're shy like me, I was a wallflower. I'm not shy anymore. Because <laughs> I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> you know, I don't care about me. I, I abandon all of that. I don't bring any crap on the stage with me, to me. Because it's not about me anymore. It's about giving you know myself and all of all of my essence okay i'm gonna shut up now <laughs> being that you mentioned a kind of source power or source energy that you've learned how to tap into that and that it is uh something that is um accessible to all of us right um and you learned 
um, while you were at the uh, Lionel Hampton Festival, what that was all about. You experienced it in a, you know, such, um, you know, in an immediate manner, uh, even not knowing exactly what that was. And, and that you've learned how to um, listen to, you know, tap into a kind of in intuition uh, about what that is for you and learning to harness that um, for your, for your uh, performing career. Yeah, we all have it. It's yeah. just learning to tap into it, accepting it, but having a desire to go there. That's, that's where it begins. You have to want to do that, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I'd love to weigh in. Um, so the online thing is freaking you out because you, you can turn on your mic. We can have a conversation. Turn, turn on your mic. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Mandy. How you doing? Pretty good. Happy Saturday, everybody. Yeah. So explain a little bit just uh, from your own mouth. Um, I guess I get, I've never really had stage fright per se. Like I grew up dancing, acting, singing. So like the live component, I have no problem. Improv, I have no problem. But then as soon as that camera is there, I just, you know, it's a whole different craft and I'm getting more comfortable with it. But I'm just wondering, you know, cause when, you know, you're in those drum circles or you're doing those, you know, open mic nights or you invite people to your space. It's a totally different dynamic. And now in this COVID, you know, there's all these other global issues that are kind of like, you know, weighing on your shoulders and you want to put on a really, you know, solid performance. But then there's that dang camera looking at you. I just, I, I, I'm getting more comfortable, but I just, if anybody has anything beyond, you know, like I'm a pretty solid performer, but um, moving beyond. And I mean, I'm, I'm learning to make love to the camera and like know that there's, you know, people that I love that are out there that are watching and like all that stuff. But, you know, and your stage manager and doing the copy and you've got sponsors and you're working on the set list and you're working on the grants and everything else, I guess you know, like you were saying, Crystal, like that yoga practice and like getting in touch with breath, you know, knowing that you're in charge. But yeah, the camera thing for me is still really quite a challenge. You, may I ask if you're looking into an actual like video camera or like a DSLR, is that what they're called? Or are you looking into a screen like we're looking into today? Yeah, so we haven't really been doing um, Zoom shows. It's been um, live stream to Facebook and Twitch simultaneously. Um, and I don't know what the name of the camera is, but it's not on a laptop. It's like higher yeah. up because my partner and I perform with our piano player who's our next door neighbor. And my partner is quite a bit taller than me. So, I mean, the camera is a bit higher than I guess. So maybe, I don't know playing with levels or something, but yeah, it's the bridge between live performance and like owning that and loving that, but getting over that hump of, is a camera yeah. on my face. <laughs> I, I, uh, the thing I was going to say is that like, I don't do, I don't do my live stuff into an actual camera. I do it like into a phone or a, a tablet and then I'm seeing myself. And then I'm also seeing someone else. So then it's easier to feel like you are having a conversation. If that's not your method, what about a picture of somebody you love right by the camera? I know that's a really stupid thing, but like, but that just came <laughs> to my mind for some weird reason. Like, what about like your mom and your dog and your sister and your bro, you know, like, yeah. What if you did that and then, you know, at least you're singing to familiar faces rather than like an empty blinking camera with a big red <laughs> you know, right <laughs> and so, you're live <laughs> <laughs> exactly right because i think it's so intimidating but you know there are always little tricks and ways that you can do that but practice makes perfect sometimes these things do not happen overnight that's something i did want to say generally is that you can't just turn off nervousness it's not a switch so as much as we're all saying this as like professional performers who have done this for years it's not a switch i used to screw up a word in a song and my ears would go hot and i was so convinced that they were bright red 
and <laughs> you know and and you get these feelings like in your chest and like in your cheeks and like these are practiced moments so as much as you can't rehearse being on stage like like you can rehearse in a rehearsal hall or in your house or in a room forgive yourself of the things that happen nobody's noticing them on stage and guess what the audience doesn't know what you're supposed to be doing so whatever it is that you do they think is the right thing so don't go you know ah, sh pardon my language shit 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 you know like just just receive what you just did and just be like i'm gonna spin that into something that looks right now or if you hit a wrong note just do, do a little run in that area you know like there are absolutely always flexible right so so i just wanted to say those things too any uh, anybody else can weigh in as well I, I, I would love to weigh in sorry d did you have something okay um yeah that's the thing that came to mind sort of builds on what you just said Crystal, which is you can do this whether you're doing it on a phone or what or something like a platform where you can see yourself and see other people, or you can do it if you're just working with a camera. Either way, what you could try is actually inviting a small group of friends slash allies to log on ahead of time with you. So before you're actually going live on the stream, 15 to 30 minutes before, whatever feels good to you. And just be with you, like have them on Zoom, even if you're, you're performing to the camera that's set up over here, have them on Zoom on an iPad or whatever on your phone, just off to the side, off camera, and be like, hey, can you listen to me do my sound check slash warm up? And again, it's the, friend, it's the psychology of the friendly faces. This is why, you know, so many of us start out at open mics with our five friends in the audience. Like that, that's where we start, or we start at home, or we start out doing house concerts. So again, it's like, yeah, bring, how can you bring some element of that feeling of safety and feeling of who am I actually performing for? Because that's the weird thing with the camera. You can't see the audience. So it's weird. And the audience, the interplay, it's the exchange of energy between you and the audience that like goes into that, that source kind of energy um, that Dee was speaking to. So when you're just looking at this round little circle, where is my source? What is this? I'm singing to a machine, like I'm performing to a machine. So if you can somehow get the friendly faces off, off on the side, um, hey guys, just join me a few minutes early and, and just be with me and maybe even they'll give you feedback and help you with the sound check. And then also you will be less nervous about technical mess ups because you've done a tech rehearsal basically already right. just before you go live. So if you do the rehearsal on a different day, well, as you know, with tech, it's different every time. Oh, and yeah. it could be different, your internet could be worse that day, whatever it's gonna be. And this way, you know, ahead of time, and that is just gonna help ground the energy and be like, I'm good. And then whatever you're doing will already be warmed up, body will be warmed up, mind will be kind of like coming down into body and down into the settled place. And then you can just kind of go more seamlessly into that live stream. I think this kind of segues with that connection with the audience. That's an integral piece of today's conversation. And, you know, that's something that um, we're looking at, like Dan Mangan's um, side door uses Zoom and there's other platforms too, but um, yeah, really missing that. And I mean, I've been hearing that for weeks from, you know, not just fellow performers, but humans um, so lacking in that, um, seeing a friendly face and having that interactivity and that's the same for our audiences too um, but as a performer like yeah playing to a camera in, in our you know studio space is grand and we've got lots of great reception and stuff too but there's something really solely lacking sorely lacking in um, not seeing the audience or seeing those people and sometimes when you're doing like giant space they're all black anyway but you know they're there you see the shapes in the mounds and you're like okay we're good but yeah into the void of the camera is kind of a weird weird thing you know something i tried this is really crazy okay because <laughs> <laughs> i believe me i understand it as much experience as I've had in all kinds of situations, that little red dot just, it can paralyze me, right? 
And so, I mean, this is just since COVID happened. I tried, I got, uh, I had my husband actually <laughs> get a mirror, okay, and set it up just behind the camera. I did that. And it like, it made all the difference in the world. You know, it, it's kind of like, you know, me looking at me here in, in this format right now, I can see me, you know, and okay. So I got the little camera in front of me, you know, and the little red dot, but all of a sudden the dot didn't fill up my whole <laughs> visual space there <laughs> anymore like it had been doing and I can okay yeah okay I can be me and you know and and so forth but that really helped I, I've only done it once but it, it really made the difference that time so I'll probably try it again <laughs> I will try it brilliant thank you just one last thing that that's so brilliant I love that you can also cover up the red dot piece of electrician's tape <laughs> Oh yeah! You know, if that just <laughs> not be sure gone. <laughs> just make sure that you actually are rolling. That's the only danger with that is that that is the that's basically it's not there to ruin your life. It's there as a monitor to assure you that indeed this is being recorded, right? Right. Um, even though it can feel like that our worst little millimeter of an enemy, um, it's actually just there to be to like confirm yes, this is doing what you want it to be doing. But if that's freaking you out, you can tape over it as long as you have somebody else who's sort of like operating or as long as you're able to have somebody who can like check to make sure it's okay. Um, yeah, that's an option as well. Amazing. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Thanks for weighing in on that, everybody. Um, I see that um, Jill had a comment and a question as well. Jill, did you want to unmute yourself and Go ahead and ask your question. Ask your question. Um, I just wanted to go back to what you guys were talking about, what Dee had mentioned about um, energy and that sort of a thing on the stage. And um, it's easy uh, for one thing to, to say, but another to actually do it. Because I noticed that I feel a lot of energy. I mean, it doesn't really matter where people are, but I, I'm really super sensitive to it. And um, when I get on stage sometimes, like when I first started getting on stage, it actually would pull me and I would sing louder and I, would, um, I wouldn't have the control uh, over the energy. It would just kind of like take over me while I'm starting to learn how to harness that, like you're saying, like kind of take the energy and then pull it into yourself, right? So um, I just time and experience is helping, but you know, do you, any of you ladies have any other tips or exercises or things like that? Like, you know, like maybe grounding or things like that. But in the moment, like you say, when you get so excited, you like, you don't have control. Like it's a tornado happening, right? Like it's hard to pull yourself back in. So yeah, any tips or exercises or anything like visualizations, anything like that, that can kind of help bring that in. There's a lot of those. There's things. a lot of those. Things. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, for me, I'm always going to go, I'm always going to start with the mental part of it. Okay. What do you want? Okay. You know what you don't want, but I think if, unless we take the time to actually come up with what it is we do want, uh, we're, we're just out there in, in, in a hit and miss situation, right? Um, but one, one little practical thing you can do is uh, just get in front of a mirror, you know, so you can see what you're doing. There, there's, there's something I used to do. Uh, I had no idea whatsoever. I did this for years and I somehow saw a video of myself. And when I was singing, I'm, I'm going to get up here and just... I, I would be singing a ballad, and with this hand, I have my mic hand, right? And this hand is down at, bent at the elbow, right? But, and it was just doing like this. You know, I could be singing a song that was really slow, and I had no idea that was going on, you know, until I saw that, and I said, what the heck? You know, and, but, and I had to think about it, tell myself what I wanted to do. And I, but it led me into using my left hand to gesture, to talk, 
to use it as the same way I do when I speak because I'm, I think there's some Italian in me somewhere, right? So I'm using my hands and my, and my body and some people don't like to do that and I don't do it all the time. It just kind of depends, but I try to let myself be, be um, uh, natural with it. But getting back, like you say, when you, when, how can you focus that energy first? Tell yourself that's what you want to do. And we have to be consciously vigilant about what we're doing when we're doing it in the beginning, because what you want, what you want to do is to create a new habit and habits are simply created by repetition. So you have to check yourself, but you have to be there. You have to be in the moment. You have to be conscious and just check yourself. And when you feel yourself going there on stage, you know, or in front of the, the, um, your camera at home, you know, just check yourself and do what you want to do. And when you self, feel yourself going out there again, ah, you know, bring it, just reel it back in. But the best time to do it is right there to me, is right there in the moment. It's not the only way to do it, but it's one of the ways that works for me because I've been there where you are now. Where you, you get excited and it's just, ah, it's just a wall, a wall of sound or whatever, you know? And I said, well, well, okay, no, that's not what I want to do. What do I want to do? I want to be, calm, you know, expressive, you know, conversational, you know, because I am speaking to somebody. Now that somebody is in my head, but every single person in the audience and behind me is that somebody, that one somebody. So I can just give them acknowledgement, 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 you know, acknowledgement. I don't, I'm not staring anybody down, you know, cause that makes not only you're uncomfortable, but they're uncomfortable now. Cause, Oh my God, will she stop looking at me? You know? So it's just, you know, so, but it's just, uh, in the beginning until it becomes the new habit, conscious being conscious, uh, uh and vigilant about where you are and what you're doing and just choose to reel it in. And, and the more you do that, pretty soon, that'll be your new norm, you know, but it's, it's just creating a new habit. Right. And I, I noticed too, because um, I always sang naturally, but then I started seeing a vocal coach. And the good thing about, you know, having somebody walk you through it is that they point out things that you don't realize you're doing. You know, like, how do you say, oh, I'm doing this habit when you don't really know you're doing it? You know, and the same thing, like what you're saying on the stage, you're like, do you know you're doing that? Or, I mean, people say that, you know, if I'm doing like, you know, Joplin or something like that, I'm like, I'm like in it. And they're like, you know that you're like doing that thing? And I'm like, uh, no, <laughs> you know, you're just in that moment. Right. But, but yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a, a great thing. Yeah. Change your habits. Right. And just, yeah. Kinda. But it is weird to stand in front of a mirror. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but when you when you can do that, when you can do that, I know I know exactly what you're saying. But when you can do that, boy, that just opens up a whole new world, a whole new world. When you can have your video self videotape yourself and see, and or have somebody do it when you're performing, you know, and so you can see those little crazy things that you're doing. You know, then you, you have some place to work. But if you're in denial, you know, or a fearful, you know, to, well, you just kind of float along where you are, you know. Yeah, step out of the comfort, comfort zone. <laughs> Thank you. That's for, awesome. for years, my friend Brett Miles in Edmonton, he's a saxophone player. He would record everything we ever did. This guy would put his cell phone up here, over here, It'd be the worst recording. <laughs> yeah. However. He said, you have to watch yourself to know what you're doing, as is being said. And for years, I denied to do this. I resisted this. I resisted it so hard. And then I finally started seeing what I was doing. And even now, COVID times, I do my Tuesday night shows. And I go back and I watch it. Not in a vain way, but to see how can I change? What did I do? You know, it's a game plan. You got to, you got to strategize. You got to figure it out in order to strategize. You got to know what you did in order to know where you do what you're going to go and do. So I think, yeah, the videotape, the mirror is amazing for practicing. The videotaping is incredible for 
um, what do you call it? Post perspective. There's another word that I cannot figure out right now, but you know, posterity, is that it? Um, you know, and, and that kind of stuff will always help in terms of channeling the energy right there in that moment. It is all about a plan and it is all about building a habit. But, um, I think again, as you warm up, like if you have a routine at home and then backstage and then on stage, you know, then, and you're not just going with a loose thing, then it also helps to even keel and balance out what you're, where you're going and what you're expecting to do. So if you have a plan to uh, warm up at home and then have a 10 minute warm up for backstage for yourself, and then have a couple of things that you do, who knows, it might be like, you know, like a, like a jumping jack and then a, you know, play some <laughs> with your friend. And then, you know what I mean? Have a predictable routine that puts you in the mindset to know that you're ready for the game. I keep on referencing athletes, but it's true, right? <laughs> it's a game where we're in it and we're ready to go and perform and play and do what we're doing, right? So preparation. Yeah, that's if, true. if anybody thinks that as a performer, you should just be able to walk on stage cold and feel nothing and deliver, no, we are so much weirder creatures than that as performers. So all of this ritualistic stuff, visualization, like you're, that we're really like looking behind the curtain today here. Um, this is what we need. This is what is required. It is a mind game. It is a mindset game. Um, there is actually this much to it and we all do this. Um, those of us who stick, stick around and stick it out, we develop these coping mechanisms. And so it's not, it's, it's what's required of, of the profession, of the field, right? We all find our ways of moving through that are right for us and that come out of us. So somebody else's way might not, might not work. Um, I wanted to just share one thing about um, just to Jill's question about like what happens when you feel that your energy is too big and you're like maybe absorbing or taking on too much. I can very much relate to that. And I've definitely had that thing where I'm like, oh, my cheeks are starting to go numb. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. I've got that like, that like really deep tremble. And it's not the tremble of nervousness. It's not the fear tremble. It's like the holy crap energy. It's just like, there's so much and the thing that is the most helpful for me that sort of comes from my dabbling in like Buddhist meditation, I'm not Buddhist, but I've dabbled. Um, and there's definitely some interesting lessons to be taken from that system is when you feel a big emotion or a big feeling or a big bodily sensation, instead of going, oh crap, and like resisting it and being like, ah, I shouldn't be feeling this. And the fact that I'm feeling it shows that I'm a failure and shows that this, the whole performance is doomed. To remind yourself, feelings are temporary and they move through. So when I feel that like weird thing where I'm like, ooh, things are a little bit too big, a little bit too hot, I just go, it's okay, just keep going. It's gonna pass within 60 seconds. And it almost always does. And I'm sure Dee and Crystal, you have <laughs> experienced, it's a phenomenon. It's a, it's a really interesting thing. It's almost like a magic trick. I can guarantee that when I feel that like, whoa, we might be uh, just on the edge of getting out of control here. I just go, oh, hi. Like, oh, hi, adrenaline. Oh, hi, numbness. Oh, hi, shakes. I'm not gonna make a story about you. I'm just gonna say hi to you, I'm gonna greet you, and I know that you're only here because you're trying to help me get my job done. And I am gonna acknowledge you, let you in, and I'm, I know that you're gonna settle down in about a minute, so I'm just gonna keep going until you settle down. And so really, that's like the sort of complex, that's the more detailed thing behind fake it till you make it. You just, just keep going, but acknowledge it. Don't push it down. Don't resist it. Don't judge yourself for feeling it. That's not going to help anything. And that will make you tense when really what we need to be doing is opening and welcoming that thing that Dee's talking about, like that open heartedness that applies not just to the people in the room with you. It applies to the feelings in yourself. You have to open your heart and shine the love beam 
on all of the feelings that you're feeling too. It's like radical self-acceptance. That's awesome. <laughs> I just realized I that I just, I just sent something just to Jill, but I meant to send it to everybody. Um, I had a vocal coach tell me to clench my butt cheeks when I'm feeling really nervous on stage. And it totally helps. It's like, I'm fine. Never mind. You know, like it reminds you you have a body or something. Anywho. Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk about, um, we've been talking a lot about kind of blockages that come from within, but maybe strategies for dealing with um, like distractions or negativity that are coming from other um, sources, like maybe a dismissive sound tech or like uh, performing to an audience that's like talking over you throughout a performance. Yeah, does, it, does anyone have strategies oh, for dealing oh, yeah. with those kinds of things? Okay. <laughs> yeah. I think all three of us have had that up the yin yang, you know, <laughs> over time. So, um, well, that too starts with you. You know, uh, are you going to go with them or are you going to do your thing in spite of them? I've had dismissive musicians. I've had this many dismissive sound texts because they know everything. Well, I happen to know as much as they do about me and my voice and my sound, what I want to hear. Okay. So, and then being a woman, you got to deal with that part, you know, and being a woman of color okay, for me in these big things that I'm doing with uh, symphony orchestras and all that kind of stuff. So it's there all the time. Musicians, Sometimes, uh, in the past, I don't tolerate that stuff anymore. Um, but um, yeah, so we all, we all have that, but it starts with you. And I can say that now after having gone through, oh my God, you know, and what have I done wrong? You know, how do I, I'm, you know, been there, done that, you know, but the choice is at some point you have to make, are you going to stay there or are you going to move forward and be you? and take charge of you because they're just picking up many times. Uh, uh, well, if they, 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 it's like they, they, they push that energy out there. And if, if you don't slice and dice it right then, they'll push more. Okay. So, but how do you slice and dice? Well, you just refuse to accept it. That's the simplest way to do it. But you got to learn how to do that. That means building up the confidence within yourself to be able to do that. And you learn how to, you know, uh, um, being, uh, you, I guess you kind of learn how to be rather diplomatic about that, you know, but a diplomatic with, with, uh, with, um, Confidence. I, I had that actually not that long ago. This was like towards the end of last year. I was with a, an orchestra and um, we were in a, a big hall that had a, a very unique kind of, um, of uh, uh, what do you call the sound thing um, in, a, in a space? Acoustics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, the acoustics were very unique in this place, you know. So um, the sound technician came up to me in his authoritative kind of way and said that, you know, he had this under control and, you know, it's a very unique room and so forth. And he had these settings and all of this kind of stuff. And I said, oh, that's very nice. You know, thank you very much. Um, and of course, then when, when we had the sound check, it was all screwed up. Okay, so um, then I have to figure out, okay, him and how I'm going to get to him and then I'm going to say maneuver, manipulate, move him to where I need to go that's going to help me, you know, and that meant we, we had to go back and forth, but I'm always diplomatic, I'm always kind and so forth, but, uh, and I refuse to accept his attitude. I refuse. It's not allowed. You know, so he can talk up the yin yang. I don't care, but I am moving towards what I want. And that's to have the sound that I need to get through this evening, you know, and it, it, it took a while, you know, 
And I said, yeah, you know, I really, really appreciate what you're doing, but can you do this? Can you, you know, la, da, 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 can you do this? And pretty soon I had exactly what I wanted and we didn't have to get out of line. I didn't have to go to a place that I didn't want to go. Cause if you go to that place over there, then you have to figure out how you're going to get back to do your, sh to be in the moment, to do your show, right? So you have to find that place within you and it takes time, it takes experience. You know, it's not just overnight with a snap of a finger, uh, but that's that has to be, once again, you have to be consciously vigilant of what you want, what you want to achieve. To, to, to achieve. It's once again, living in the end, in the end result, what do you want the end result to be? Just by thinking about that, you automatically start putting that kind of energy out there. You know, it's, it's unconscious. You don't even have to think about it, but the energy, energy is everywhere, everything. So if you go, know what you want to get, and that is for people to start listening, that means you might have to open up, pay attention and see what's happening, you know, and what, what, what energy can you put out there that's gonna help them to get involved. And sometimes guess what? It don't work. And then you have to say, oh, well, this, this is not the rest of my life. This is one daggum instance, you know, and hey, you know, it gives, then it gives me a chance to practice in front of an audience, you know, to, to just to, to do my songs, you know, I'm still open, but that, then I get into my songs and, and, and you know, what, what can I do differently? My interpretation, my storytelling ability, my improvisation, you know, and so forth. And you never know, and many, many, many times early in my career before I figured this all out, you know, uh, a lot of times all of a sudden the room is quiet, you know, and I don't even, yeah. couldn't even tell you what I did, you know, but I went to that place, you know. So, uh, and I'm sure, you know, Crystal and, and Deidre have some other ways because what we're all saying is just one possibility based on our personal experiences, right? So anyway, yeah, so it's, it's you, what do you want? You know, you're, you're, you, you do all the work to, to, to do the best that you can in that moment. You can't worry about the moments before or the moments coming up. It's just right then that counts because that's where we are right now. That's all we have. So if you're doing the best you can do, if you're receptive and, and um, uh, to uh, trying something new, to being fluid and flexible and all, that's all you can do, you know? And then for the rest, oh well, you know? <laughs> just leave it there and keep it moving. May I add to that? Um, I love, 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 love. Okay. What kept on coming, I love a good analogy. You're gonna, you're gonna get to know this about me. Um, is that like a sharp knife is going to make a clean, precise cut. So the sharper you are at specifically knowing what you need as a performer, not necessarily in every space. I don't expect you to become a massive sound technician, you know, um, expert. But knowing that, say, on a soundboard, you need a little more high and a little less mid and a little more low or whatever the case may be. And if you want to know how to find that out, find the sound guy that you like and ask him what he did so that he, you can help to, you know, like, educate yourself. Um, again, you, you get more bees with honey, of course, right? Like the kinder you are, the more communicative and, and diplomatic you are, the better everything's going to be. The more respect there is flowing, it's going to come right back your way. But the sharper you are at knowing what you specifically need in a room um, in terms of communicating with everybody, the better you're off you're going to be. Now, in terms of uh, chatty Cathy's at a show, <laughs> Um, you know, or I did, I did this, um, sort of, it's like an intimate cabaret style theater show in Guilt and Co. First, we did it at the CBC Black Box 700 Theater. Then we did it at Guilt and Co. And it's like night and day different. And my, um, but the difference was that Guilt and Company felt like home to me. And my, uh, my director and co-creator was like, there was so much noise. There was a bar going on. There was people chatting in the back. There was this, there was that. There's, a, there's something to go back to feeling at home in your space is going to help you 
feel more comfortable with adjusting and being flexible to those situations, but even more so, um, don't be shy to talk to the audience. Don't be shy to either, and do it in your personality. It can come through as a joke. It can come through as a general kind kindergarten style teacher statement. It can come through as whatever you need, but you can either say, hey, what you guys talking about over there? Or you can say just a friendly reminder, you know, as your middle of the song stage banter, just a friendly reminder that this is a listening audience to be respectful of volume for not only your audience, but your performers. You can say it in any way you want. Be straight, be sharp about it and cut as cleanly as you need to, to make the space your home for you and for everyone else. Because everyone, the, I, when I'm in a show and people are talking, I'm like, I wish they would shut up. I wish those people would just be quiet. And when somebody, like I saw Desiree Dawson on stage one day and she did it and she just, she just got to the point and she's like, people need to shut up. <laughs> Not quite as harshly, but she just basically said that. And I was like, that's what I've been thinking this whole time. Thank you. Because you're in command. So don't forget that you're again the leader of, the, of that moment. Command it. Yeah, you you learn you learn to speak the jargon. Uh, I'm always encouraging my my students. You know, hey, you can't. You're a singer. What made you a singer? Is it that because you went and got a song that you like and you you memorize the lyrics and the melody? And if you're a jazz singer or whatever, you learn some little improvisations. Does that make you it? You know, no, it doesn't. You know, if you're going to go out there, you have gotta learn the jargon. You know, uh, for me and, and my sound. 500 hertz is my, my terrible spot, you know? So I need that down all the time. For my EQ on my, on my sound, what I'm looking for is a gentle smile. That's what starts it out, you know? So all of this stuff, and how did I find that out? I did exactly what Crystal said. I asked some, uh, uh, some, some text that I, uh, sound text that I know, you know, well, you know what is this and how, how do you describe this to somebody, you know? And so forth. And the moment you start talking like that because you know the jargon, all of a sudden those texts that were giving you a little problems, it, what, huh? Oh, okay. So you're not like some musicians think, just a little girl singer up there who doesn't is not a musician. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So you gotta, uh, yeah, you you gotta you, you have a responsibility as a matter of fact to learn the jargon. You know. And everything Crystal said is absolutely it, you know, and, and, and I'm sure Deidre has something to add to that, but yeah, you got responsibility. And when you take, when you assume the responsibility, that gives you power. That gives you power. Okay. Yeah. Um, exactly. This is so amazing. I'm taking notes furiously as I'm listening <laughs> here. Um, one of the things that, that sort of came to mind was, yeah, a lot of those, especially when we talk about sound tech culture, it's a very male dominated culture that's starting to change now, but um, it just is culturally. Um, there's, there's a lot of expectations or rather lack of expectations for the knowledge of women coded performers. Um, so first of all, like just on a sort of like coming from a place of revenge, it's just nice to kind of like know at least as much or even more than that person. Um, so you can kind of be like, ha -ha. Um, but also the thing to keep in mind is that some of those guys, they really act like the venues, their kingdom, right? The venue is also your kingdom for your gig. You're not subservient to them you are both working professionals. That is both your workplace. So you are actually work colleagues in that relationship. So to know they actually don't have the upper hand on you. It can be freaky because on some level they actually do have some power over you like to change things or to not, not trust what you're saying or not believe what you're asking for or second guess you. But really, yeah, what, what's been said previously around like being really professional and don't don't let them get to you if they're talking to you like a little girl, um, which some of them will try as a power, as a power move to just simply not, not play in, uh, you know, there's many ways of doing that. You can just sort of brush past it, not even acknowledge it and just be like, yeah, so anyway, and just like back to that, back to that jargon talk, back to that professional kind of like business, like, 
um, manner that can really help. It's like fighting fire with fire. Like you cannot capitulate to somebody's holier than thou attitude because you're holy. And maybe they just don't know that yet. And maybe now's the moment when you're gonna inform them and then they're gonna receive that message and go, oh, uh, I see I'm dealing with somebody here who actually knows their worth. So yes, uh, I just reiterate everything that's been said. It, it is a process though. It's a process, you know. And once again, you have to want to take, you know, uh, go through the process. You know, you, you can make it, you can drag it out, uh, the learning process, as long as you feel like you need to drag it out, or you can speed it up. You can speed up parts of it and drag out, you stay as long as you need to stay in any aspect of it, that's up to you, you know, but it, it definitely is a process. None of us got this overnight, you know. So hang in there, you know, claim your power, claim your space. As Dr. Phil says, you got to name it to claim it you know, so claim it, you know, and, and uh, just move forward and, and don't dog yourself so, so much, you know, oh God, just, I could have done this and I didn't do that. No, nah, that's already happened. So what are you going to do differently the next time? You know, that's where we have to stay. We can't go back in, into the past. We, nothing's, it's already done. That'll depress the hell out of you, you know, and you don't want to get into the future anticipating that that's, oh my God, because that'll create anxiety, you know, so it's just right now, okay, Look at the, review the video, you know, in your mind of what, what you felt, what, what happened, the la-di-da-di-da, and then get, pick out of that what you do want, you know, and what you do not, and that includes what you do not want to repeat, but what do you want to do? If it's, there's something you did that you don't want to repeat, well, what can you do differently? And then just take it from there and apply that to the, the next opportunity. I'm learning a lot. First of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone. And um, my question came from a place of um, recognizing that I'm uncomfortable while performing because um, I got some feedback once um, from a manager of a restaurant saying um, that um, it the my performance felt more comfortable to me than it did to everyone else. And while I d I don't think that the manager knew how I felt. I realized that it did feel uncomfortable to me. Um, so therefore, it probably felt uncomfortable to everyone else. And I, I received the message that it was an uncomfortable performance. Um, so I was thinking, until I feel comfortable, what can I do to broach the like, fake it till you make it? Um, and I'm kind of interested in whether or not um, in your performance experience you've at any time um, used a persona to get there or or if you just use a persona in any other way to um, make a relationship with the audience okay girls <laughs> uh, yeah once again we've all been there girl <laughs> all of us i'm sure um you uh there's something you said in the beginning now I'm trying to remember what it was but um it's it's uh you the, the comments like that can break you down you know just one person now who is he you know who is this man and who really cares what he thinks you know, do you, are you going to internalize that and carry that with you for the rest of your life? Are you going to say that is his personal opinion, you know, and yes, maybe I did feel uncomfortable, but it's just for this moment, unless you choose to keep taking it with you every time you have an opportunity. It's your choice. We always, always have a choice. Okay. So, but as far as the actual discomfort, you know, it's about once again, going back to claiming your space. It is your space. What do you want to do while you're in your space? Are you going to open up, you know, and be comfortable because it is your space, you know, or are you going to feel cramped in, and, 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 uh, uh, because you feel like you're in somebody else's space trying to make everybody happy. You know, you gotta, you gotta choose, 
I won't say you got it because you don't have to got to do nothing. <laughs> you know, I would suggest that um, you choose a space, you know, where, and everybody out there is your friend. You may have never seen them before, but up here, they're in your friend mentally, they're in your, your friend in your space. So, and I know when you, I, I can imagine, I don't even know you, but I would imagine that when you're with your best, best friend or the, the, your favorite person in your family, you are totally unzipped and you are you. You can choose to go there when you're in performance. It's just a choice. That's how it starts. But if you're waiting for something to happen, you'll be waiting. If you choose to make something happen, to make a change and start creating a new habit, that's what will happen. It's a choice. You can start now, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes. There is somebody, I think her name's Dr. Nina, and she says, take the meat and leave the bones because there is really some cool and useful information to be had when you have terrible interactions with people and they can make my blood boil and they can make me feel completely deflated or gutted or whatever you want to say, but take the meat and leave the bones because if you have information from that that you learned something then shake off all of the rest of the negativity and move forward with that information in your toolbox so that now you have some really great you have a great footing to move forward on right so i don't know the context of that but you know what i have had so many gigs at so many lounges and hotels where they're like, you need to be more quiet. You need to quiet down. Can you turn down a little bit? We, th this guest is complaining. Then why do you have live music? I'm just talking. Like, <laughs> like this is insane. Um, there's so many things where it's like, I'm annoyed as much as they're annoyed, but I have to keep my mouth shut right now. Um, but take those moments if there is a constructive moment to be had or sometimes you just gotta throw out the whole darn thing but if there's a constructive moment to be had take the positive um and then i'm gonna go back to something i said as well before is that if you're having a hard time because you're uncomfortable in the space what do you play i, I just reread your bio um you're a piano player and an improvisational jazz classical yeah yeah um, what is your what's the performance um that you present may I, if i may ask real quickly uh well the this one that i'm referring to i was singing and i i'm not usually a singer but i was asked to sing in order to keep the gig um oh. so i was really uncomfortable with the whole thing um and i was i was trying to try something different and um change my performance up but that makes a world of sense. Context is everything. So this was a really uncomfortable presentation for you. You know, it's new, it's whatever. So in that sense, it's like, find the comfortable moments in which you can find your anchors to feel at home and feel, um, you know, grounded to what you're doing. You know, maybe do a long solo so you can catch your breath, uh, especially if you're your own instrumentalist and then come back in you know, um, but what I was going to say in regards to what I had mentioned before is bring your comfort with you, right? So you have, say, your, I don't know if you play an electric keyboard or the, the house piano or whatever it is, the, you know, but bring your comfort with you. Even if that comes in the water bottle that you love, you know, if it's a functional, but also like a mental thing. I have this gold water bottle that my husband got me for Christmas a couple of years ago. And I bring that thing on stage with me all the time because not only does it make me feel hydrated, <laughs> literally. Um, it also gives me a little grounding. It's like, this is my little, like, it's gold. So it's like my little Oscar statue, you know, it's my, it's my comfort um, relic or, you know, whatever you want to call it. It's, it's the thing that can bring me familiarity and give me a touch of grounding. If I take a drink of water from that thing, it's familiar. And then you can get back to your zone because energy ramps up, right? 
And so you got to, like we've been saying, you got to rein that stuff in and you got to use it properly. So there are tools, there are always tools to be able to sort of harness. I hope that helps. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I can, I can add something just very quick, which is that comfort versus discomfort. So setting it up as like, I should feel comfortable, but I do feel uncomfortable. It's sort of a very binary sort of black and white way of looking at the experience, which is in reality more complex than that, right? Um, it's, it's sort of like the nervousness versus adrenaline. It's like, well, they're, they're kind of more like a Venn diagram and it's this bit in the middle and you're trying to kind of go to this side, but you might be in the middle. <laughs> you might be feeling both and, and that's okay. Um, I just wanted to offer, again, another frame or another story for what discomfort actually is, and to not put that massive negative value load on discomfort. For some reason, we, in our culture, we're really terrified of discomfort, and we're really uncomfortable with discomfort. I know that's redundant. But what if discomfort is just information? What if discomfort is just information that is telling us to look more closely at something and to go, why? Why am I so uncomfortable right now? What isn't working right now? Why, why don't I feel good? So again, instead of like, it's like that Buddhist thing of acknowledging and being like, oh, oh, hello, discomfort. Okay, so why have you shown up? Why are you here with me right now? What are you trying to tell me? I'm gonna to listen to you instead of going, shut up, shut up, why are you here? No, you're throwing me off my game, discomfort. I'm supposed to be comfortable. Um, instead of seeing, saying that I'm supposed to be thing, be like, oh, hey, this is what I am feeling right now. And let me open to it again. Okay, what are you trying to tell me? Because I guarantee discomfort always has a message. Anger always has a message. There's something in there that needs to be seen. There's something in there that's hidden that needs to be uncovered. And that's why it's bugging you, it's poking you, and it's making you feel bad because sometimes that's the only way they can, it can get us to listen and figure out what's really going on. So dis, discomfort is not inherently negative. Anger is not inherently negative, And even conflict is not inherently negative. It's just information. I don't know, something that Crystal taught me that, um... I know it's basic and I'll just, but uh, vocal rest is just as important as your vocal warm up. I was like, wow, that's kind of like, I know that's super basic and super um, simple, but it's like, wow, that's, you know, it's kind of profound. Like, I don't know, I just maybe neglected that a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know. That's something that I learned, <laughs> something that we were talking about today. Actually, I can add something because in our session we were talking, I was, because I'm pretty new to pursuing music, so I was asking about like what life is like as a musician and I was debating whether I should find a job and like do all of these other interdisciplinary things while I pursue music and I think I, I realized that as a musician you, you kind of have to do a lot of things at the beginning in order to make it work because I thought that like oh maybe I should just pursue music full-time at the beginning but then I met like um, Roxanne who's like a instrument designer and that was really cool because I was like oh you can actually do things that are related to music but are still like not exactly making music but yeah I just realized there's a lot of different possibilities with your career as a musician and it's not just performing and not just like creating music so that was cool uh, to get like this re, I guess, affirmation that I don't just have to be doing music. Yeah. 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 That's so true. <laughs> I, I just wanted to add one thing to that. Um, and I think, I think a lot of people will agree with me uh, when I say that um, once you start doing that, um, and when I say pursuing music, I mean primarily performing, uh, you know, whether it be performing or releasing your own music, you, you do find that there are, you know, most of the time you do have to be very flexible in terms of what other areas in music you dabble in because, you know, not, not just for only practical reasons, but just um, 
it, it's sometimes unavoidable that you do step into other areas of music and, and that's totally natural. And I think that's, that's only, that's, that's a great way to learn um, about other aspects of the industry as well. So it's, it's all good things. Yeah. yeah. The, way, the way things are today, you almost have to do that. You know, I don't know anybody, uh, I, I, well, I won't say I don't know anybody, but younger folks, I don't know any younger people who can only do music. I don't know any, you know, uh, and, and when I say music, I'm, I'm also referring to performance, you know, maybe to recording. Um, but we, we ha these days, you, you have to know so much, uh, uh, so many other things about the music industry, you know, and today with, with you young people, God bless you, um, you know, you, you got to be social media whizzes, you got to, you know, be promotion whizzes and on, on all that kind of stuff. Whereas when I came up, um, you know, towards in the beginning of my career, I, I didn't have to do that. I could just do music, you know, and I just been blessed where that's virtually all I've done. Right. Um, but that's on the way out. It, it's probably already out. <laughs> I don't know, you know, uh, you, unless you find somebody like uh, 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 Jacob Collier. You guys, okay, you, you guys have to him. Yeah. Jake, Jacob. Yeah. Jacob Collier. Yeah, if you don't know about him, just go do the YouTube thing. <laughs> but he's a he's a dadgum genius, you know, a prodigy and all of that kind of stuff. But uh, it's unusual, but it's not impossible. You know, but uh, as Darcy was uh, saying, the more you know, the, you know, information is like light. It's like a flashlight, even in the light, when you turn it on, it's like a focus. You can see better, you can see clearer, you can make better decisions, you know, uh, and you're just more knowledgeable. You, you're in, in um, you can oversee, you can direct. Uh, and stay focused in on what it is you want to accomplish because it's yours, you know, and you don't have to know, be the whiz kid on any, any of it, but you need to have some knowledge of, of, of what's going on and, and how to get these things done, right? Uh, today has been so great. This is one of those topics that gives me life and that buzzy, amazing, excited feeling. I love talking about performance. So thank you all for just being present for it. Dee, I've learned so much from you. Deirdre, I've learned so much from you. Just the, all the perspectives, even if it's familiar, a different way of, of seeing it or approaching it or hearing it helps. Um, so as I say, every time I feel like I'm cheating by being here as a mentor because I feel like I'm always a mentee learning. Um, I think just to summarize, keep your tools plentiful and sharp, meaning have all the education, have all the information, as Dee just said, have all of the um, preparation you can um, so that in any situation you're in, you're flexible and you're uh, able to adapt because this industry is not one for not being flexible. <laughs> it is not a rigid place, you know? Um, and, and I think secondly, just forgive yourself for anything that happens. We're all growing, we're all changing, we're all learning. So just, you know, keep, keep forgiving yourself and growing through all of it. Crystal and I, we always say it's our privilege to do this because we, we receive as much, if not more than what we give. And it's just this amazing thing. So amazing to have Dee with us here today. There were so many moments where like the little hairs on my arms were just standing straight up, like with resonance of like, oh my God, yes, she is really tapping into some, some deep truths here. And wow, like I took so many notes today for myself. Um, so it's just, just incredible. The thing, my closing thought today is the one key word that I didn't get to talk about yet today, which is trust. And trust, I have found, is the antidote to fear. And it's the antidote to anxiety and nervousness and, and second guessing yourself. So, you know, we like, why, why do we like music? Why do we like being musicians? Why do we like playing music? I would 
hazard a guess that it's partially because we love that feeling of connectedness and being in the moment that happens. I'm going to call it a flow state. And this really ties into what Dee was saying about tapping into the source. So whatever that means to you. And I just want to remind everybody that, you know, you know, when you have a really important conversation that you need to have with somebody that's maybe not going to be that pleasant and you feel so nervous about it and you're just like anticipating it. And then when you finally like speak your truth or have the conversation, it's a relief. Um, it's kind of like that. We get so wound up before we go on stage, but once we actually get there and we're doing the thing, we have to trust that the flow state will take care of us. We step into that stream and we're going to be taken with the current and we're going to be taken care of. So we trust ourselves that whatever choices we make in, in that flow state are going to be the right choice. So we're stepping into a space of improvisation, even if we're playing songs that we know by heart and that are pre-composed and pre-learned, they never happen the same way twice. You never step into the same river twice, right? So in the space of improvisation, perfection doesn't matter. It's not, it's not actually a value um, because you can't make a mistake when you're in the flow state. There's no mistakes, there's only moments. So just trusting, trusting in your ability to go with the flow and move with that state and trusting that you are both in it and you're also kind of guiding it. You like, you're, you're like the little boat on the river, but you're also the river itself. It was kind of weird, but you are. And just trusting all of that and that you're just gonna keep moving forward no matter what happens. If something unexpected happens, you don't go, oh, mistake. You go, oh, interesting. Again, it's just information. It's just information. So that's my, my offering is that trust is the antidote to fear. Well, I, I'd like to, to first of all say what a pleasure uh, it's been to, to share this uh, mentorship with these two ladies. This has been really nice. And I want to uh, thank you, Catherine, um, for Evergence uh, BC for having me as a, a mentor today. I've really enjoyed it. I love, I, me too. I love doing this kind of stuff as much as I love being on stage. Um, and there's not much more that I can say. I want to diddle Crystal and Deidre. Um, uh, you know, if it, it, what, what you, what you think and continue to think and take steps towards will eventually manifest. Okay. If you cannot think it, it can have a it can be have uh, having a, a, a successful career. It can be singing uh, a, a high C. Uh, it can be uh, um, uh, being comfortable on stage. It can be communicating with your band. It can be uh, being uh, an incredible storyteller. If you cannot think it, then it cannot be done, or at least it'll be a hit and miss situation. So you always have choice. Uh, it makes us do something that most of us uh, don't want to do, and that's to slow ourselves down, take time, and think about things and make some decisions. You know, you're not bound for the rest of your life. Uh, there's nothing permanent but change. You know, it's a good thing because uh, it keeps us moving forward, you know. Um, so yeah, uh, if uh, uh, you take all of these things into consideration that uh, we've shared with you today, I think it will help you create a, a solid foundation um, for creating anything you want to create. And we don't, uh, even within these times, these COVID times and all, the, this is not going to last forever, you know, but it's an opportunity because of the situation where we can take the time because we have the time to really create a nice solid foundation for ourselves within our career and within life in general you know so uh, I wish you all all uh, uh, success in what you desire to do and fun in creating that success um, I just really wanted to like appreciate show my appreciation for what Dee and Deirdre have been sharing it's like really inspiring to hear 
like you guys, your journey. And I just feel really inspired after listening to you guys. And D, I just wanted to ask you, because I feel like you have a lot of insight on like um, channeling like the love and the source energy. And I'm like, I'm really into that. And I was just wondering like, because my biggest struggle right now is uh, self doubt. Because I'm like, what makes me a musician versus like other people? Because like everyone likes making music, right? So like, how do you love yourself enough to not like continue that doubt and to like share your music out through love? I was just wondering what you thought about that. Uh, well, I, uh, I have in my mind, I'm a very visual person. And um, what I've learned is, uh, of course, well, uh, that can be a good thing <laughs> and it can be a, a deadly thing because my imagination can run wild in a negative sense, you know, and that, what that means is I've left the present and tried to go into the future and it's scary there, right? Yeah. Uh, or I can keep it uh, reeled in, you know, and, and deal with what I have to deal with. But um, uh, yeah, what, what I've discovered is that the, the more I um, talk to myself and tell myself what I do want, you know? And what, what I mean by that is, you know, with the doubt thing, you know, that, that I mean, I, I, I think that's normal. You know, it's a, it's a human being kind of thing, you know, but, but do you want to stay there, you know? And if the answer is no, then you can just take that doubt and move it over, let's say, uh, to, to your left. Okay, I'm going to my left anyway, you know, but and so what you create is a void and that void is subject to having any kind of bacteria, virus, uh, fungus, negativity, positivity, anything can can be there. So when you remove what it is you don't want, you have to reach over to the right and replace it with what you do want. So what do you want when it comes to that little piece of your pie, uh, uh, the angel pie this, that you label doubt? What do you want to replace that? You know? So focus on what you do want versus what you're scared of not having. Yes, yes. Okay. And the, here's the thing, you have created a habit of doubt. So if you take responsibility for that, Okay, that the fact you created that because nobody else did it, you know, you did it. And uh, if when, when it, 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 it has become a habit, okay, it's addictive, it's become a habit, but you created the habit, right? So when you remove it, okay, and you choose to go over and replace it with what you do want, nine times out of 10, that's not going to stick, okay, because it's not a habit yet. And that old habit is very strong. So it just comes over and it nudges that thing out of the way, the new thought. And, and there you go, you're back into doubt. So that's where you have to become consciously vigilant, okay, watchful and say, nope. Oh, you go over here, you know, love you. You served me for a time. It's not the way it's kind of service I wanted, but you're there. I did this, you know, and keep doing this, keep doing that until that new thing becomes the new habit. And uh, the more you get into it, the more energy you put behind it. And the energy, the energy is, is just energy. It is not good. It is not bad. It's indifferent. It, it doesn't care where you, you direct it to, something negative, something positive, something in between. So the more energy you put into the no and the, to the yes to this, the the quicker it outpictures which the the new the new um, uh, thought the new way of being the new habit that you're trying to create right so uh, but it's a process mm -hmm. you know it is a process but either you're willing to take the process or not and if you're not it's not a problem nobody's going to judge you nobody's going to criticize you maybe it's just not the time you know uh, but. It's, it's always your choice, you know? So for me, that's how I do it. And, and I do it in, in music 
and outside of music too. Because to me, it's, I'm, it's just me. And I, I, I'm a human being, so I have these struggles, you know, yeah. from time to time. And, and that's okay. I'm good with that, you know, because I know I, I, can, I can change when I get ready to, right? Yeah, I really like what you said about, like, in everything, we have a choice. Because sometimes it seems like I don't. But mm -hmm. then when you step back and you're like, oh, I, I can change how I react to the situation. Mm -hmm. And then I think it makes you more proactive and like it makes you believe in yourself more when you realize you're in control. Yeah. And yeah. when you overcome one of, you know, that, that situation, it makes you stronger. It makes you stronger. So you're, you're continuing to build your confidence, build your, your knowingness of who you really are and the power that you have to create your own reality. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Now, I just want to take a quick a moment to thank our all our participants for uh, coming together. Um, don't forget to join our uh, private Facebook group where you can still dialogue with everybody. And uh, thank our sponsors, Creative BC, the province of Brit British Columbia, and our host, the Red Chamber Cultural Society. Um, so you can send us an email at emergencebc at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Until next time, hope to see you again. Yeah, and thank you, Deidre. Take care. <laughs> thank you, Dee. Nice to see you, Darcy. It's you, Dee. And Deidre. <laughs> yes, and Darcy, hi. <laughs> okay, so long. Okay, bye-bye.